Greetings to the family. Today we're just going to discuss some of what Sam has been speaking about quite in depth in the study of the book of Revelation. And I just want to highlight one aspect of it and look at how that affects how we live life here on earth. We often get so concerned with the things that are going on around us, going on in our lives. We have trials, we have hardships, we have things that are stressful all around us, in the earth, in the nations, in the politics, in the finances. There's so much that causes men's hearts to fail them, men to be stressed and particularly young people are so stressed today that they see no future and they see no hope. Today I want to speak about the perspective of all of this and I believe that once you see the perspective you will realize that there is no need to worry. There is no need for concern. It's not unfair when Jesus himself says, do not worry. Do not care about your food and your clothes and where you're going to stay. All these things that really bother us and keep us so occupied. So much so that many lose their lives in pursuit of things that really don't matter. I'm going to read a lot of scripture and then we'll just talk of a few of these aspects that need to be highlighted in our thinking. Let's start with 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 and 12. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Last time we spoke about love that endures. And we were speaking in the context of relationships with others. But even our relationship with others are seen in the context of God's purpose and what God is doing. And because we can know who God is, because we can trust Him, because He is faithful, we can endure. That word, upameno, as we said last time, means to remain behind or stay under the burden. To stand your ground, to show endurance, to bear up against, or to persevere. So, the scripture says, those who persevere, those who stand their ground, who remain under the, the burden of whatever trial it is that you are facing, those, it says, will also reign with him. This word is actually one word, sum balaseo, which means together with sum part, and basileo means reign, or the dominion of rule of a king. So we will reign together with the basis of our ruling or our reigning is the authority in which we stand when we reign with him. That is why it is sum basileo, not just we are reigning because we are so good or so clever or because we accomplish things in life in our own strength. It is in him together with him, that we will reign. 
we will reign with the same authority. And that's the meaning of Basilio. It is, Basilica is the kingdom or the, the basis of authority from which we rule or we reign. We can see how these words, Basileo, Basilica, tie in together. But what I want you to see today and really let it become real and alive in your thoughts, your actions, and even your attitude, your emotions, is that this life we are living here on earth is a temporal life. This body is temporal and the things that we are going through, the things that we're experiencing, even the things that we strive for, the things that we aspire to accomplish and achieve in this life, it's temporal. Which means it is but a short space of time compared to eternity, that which is eternal. Now, we are issued out of God as spirit beings. Our spirits are eternal. Our spirits were issued out of God and will be assembled back into Christ when we are born again. That spirit will live on eternally. And that is our true identity. Our souls, which is our mind, our will, and emotions, are given for us for the period that we are on earth to make wise decisions, to choose to submit to that which comes by the Spirit, and to choose to obey, blindly follow the lead of the Spirit that gives us instruction and that teaches us how to live as sons of God. When we understand that we are eternal beings, but we live in this temporal life here on earth, we have to understand the purpose, the reason why we are temporarily here on earth. And in essence, if we were to sum it up in one word, it would be, we are being trained. It is preparation. It is training. It is coming to maturity. Coming to maturity happens through the training that God allows us to go through while here on earth. Based on how we respond, in this training, based on our surrender, based on our obedience, based on how we trust God and obey Him in following in that which He reveals by His Spirit. Based on that, we will then rule and reign in eternity. So this is the picture I want you to see. What happens in the temporal, in the short lifespan that we have while on earth, is essentially training for what will take place in eternity, we will reign. And God is putting us through our paces. God is the one who is training us. We've been speaking for years about sons of God coming to maturity. Why is there a need for maturity? If we're just going to go to heaven when we die, if the goal was just to make it to heaven, just to hold on long enough with your gospel ticket so that we make it to heaven, if that was the goal, there would be no need for maturity. And that's why many don't see what God is doing in the earth in terms of preparing His sons to come to maturity. Many don't see it. Many don't hear it. 
because they are still convinced that the only goal is just to make it to heaven. Well, if it's clear that God is wanting to bring us to maturity, what is the purpose? Why do we need maturity? It is because He wants us to be able to reign. He wants us to be able to rule for eternity. So I'm going to read you a few scriptures and we'll see how what we're going through on earth is temporal, but it's preparing us for that which is the purpose. God's ultimate goal with us will be seen and taking place in an eternal realm, not just in this temporal realm. This is just the preparation. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. For our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond comparison. Comparison to what? Comparison to the temporal things. Comparison to the momentary afflictions. To that which we are going through in this life, it is light momentary affliction. But it is producing, it is working for us. And it is having its work in us to produce what God wants, glory. His glory to be seen in us. And it describes this as an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond comparison. And so, verse 18, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on the temporary, not on that which we are going through in this life. We are not fixing our eyes on that, but what is unseen. We are fixing our eyes on the eternal things. Those things that can only be seen by the Spirit from an eternal perspective. And here it says it again. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And to be honest, every one of us, we get caught up in being concerned about the things that are happening in our life in the temporal realm. We get concerned about our food and our clothing and our ability to pay our bills, our finances, our income, getting a job. What are people thinking of us? How am I going to get ahead in life? How am I going to get promoted at work? To secure more income, to be able to buy food and pay my bills. These are the things that become the vicious cycle. It's a cycle of slavery that we are caught up in, in our mindset, when our eyes are only fixed on the temporal. If you look at the temporal, you will worry, you will fear. You will be stressed. But when we focus on what God is doing, and He's promised, remember, that He swore with Himself by an oath, He will bring about. So what God is going to do in us is a done deal. He's going to produce a mature corporate son. And you and I can be part of that. And if we're part of that, there is absolutely no need to stress or be concerned. Because what we are going through now is training. It's not the end goal. The end goal is not to secure a paycheck. The end goal is not to be able to have enough money to, to buy the things you want or the things you need or secure for yourself. Um, some type of security or some type of 
advantage in getting ahead in life? That is not our concern. If we are keeping our eyes on that which is eternal, our concern will be what God is busy doing in us, what He is producing in us. This glory that is, in fact, God being accurately seen through His Son. That is the glory of God. That which represents Him well, which speaks well of Him, which brings praise to Him. In, in other words, when people see you and they see you in His glory, they are seeing the glorious manifestation of God. Or they are seeing God manifested in you, which is glorious. It's not gold dust and it's not some weird manifestations or speaking in tongues or seeing miracles. Those are, sometimes that happens, but it's byproducts. It's not what we're pursuing. We are pursuing the glory of God to be made known in us. It's not gold dust and weird manifestations. It is God revealing Himself through our lives because it's been surrendered to His Spirit. And this is going to be completed not in our life while on earth. It's going to be completed even in eternity. We get to look at this. So it's working for us a far surpassing glory. Now, what that word is in fact using, let's just read it again. A weight of glory that is far beyond comparison, it says in this translation. But that word, far beyond, is the word hyperbole. Hyper means over and above, excessive. And this word means far surpassing to excessiveness. And it uses the word twice. It actually says, far surpassing excessively to excessiveness. It says, hyperbole to hyperbole. It's a super superlative. It is beyond measure. It is over and above. It is exaggeration. Now, in English, we have the word hyperbole. And how it's used in the English language, it doesn't reflect this excessiveness. But one of the definitions of a hyperbole is that it's an over-exaggeration. It's like saying, oh, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. That's a hyperbole. You can't really eat a horse and you never get to manage to eat a whole horse, but you over-exaggerating. Now, that's what this word means. Far surpassing to excessiveness, it is working in us a glory. A glory that is so superlative, so surpassing, so excessively beyond what we could imagine. That's what is working in us. That kind of glory. And the glory, as we've said, is the unspoken manifestation of God. It's not just what we say, but it is what is seen in how God is manifested in our lives. And that word includes brightness, illumination. There will come an illumination wherever we are of the things of God as God is revealed in those circumstances. That's His glory. It includes in that a majesty. And we understand from months ago when we spoke about being the magisterium of God, being the magistrates, being included in the Elohim. That's a, a majesty 
is connected also to rule, a magisterium that rules. Now let's go through the scripture and we'll see the context of the eternity as being trained in the temporary to rule or reign in the eternal. Let's start in Daniel, where he prophesies Daniel 17 and 18 says, These four beasts, it was describing the four kingdoms, the four beasts, are four kings who, who will arise from the earth. And after the fourth one, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. That's eternity. Forever and ever. It actually says it three times. Forever, yes, forever and ever. Verse 26 says, But the court will convene and his domain will be taken away. The domain of the, the last king, the beast, will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, dominion, and greatness of the kingdoms under all of heaven, not kingdom up in heaven, the kingdoms under all of heaven will be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will serve and obey him. We're starting to see a picture now. There's going to be a dominion given to the saints. And it is to rule over the kingdoms under all of heaven. Kingdoms on the earth. The kingdoms of this world will become or will come under the kingdom of God and of his Christ. That's us. He's Christ. That's us. We are included in Christ. We are in fact the body. We are the manifestation of Christ being the body of Christ. And the rulers will serve and obey him. So we see a very important aspect of what qualifies us to rule is learning obedience. Now scripture says Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. We too, to come to maturity as sons of God, need to learn obedience. In ruling in the eternal realm, that will be for the ones who have learned obedience while in the temporary, while on earth. There will come a time where this temporal life is over and we start entering into the millennium which is very different. Then those that didn't learn obedience will not rule. They will then be ruled over. And those that proclaim the name of Jesus have got their ticket to heaven, but never learned obedience, never came to maturity, they will be ruled over and taught obedience by a rod of iron. We'll look at these passages of Scripture. Let's just go through it. So Jesus speaks of this when um, he's speaking in Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the re renewal of all things. The renewal of all things is, there's a new heaven and a new earth. The old will pass away. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This is the renewal of all things. When the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me, Jesus said, will also sit on twelve thrones, 
judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we know 12 speaks of divine authority and dominion, rulership, divine governance. So the government of God will be carried out from the sons of God, the mature corporate son that sits collectively on 12 thrones. You'll see this number 12 throughout. Right at the end of Revelation, we will see the river of God. And we will see the 12 trees on each side whose fruit is healing for the nations. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous to think this is in heaven. Why would there be nations in heaven? Why would nations need healing? In heaven. Now the healing that takes place is the bringing to obedience those who have not surrendered by obedience in previous life. Those in the temporal life and you know, when they could make the choice. Those who are ruling are the 12 trees on each side. We know 12 times 2 Two, 12 sets of 12, so it's 24, represented in the 24 elders, which also speaks of all things now in heaven and on earth. When the rule in heaven and the rule on earth is combined in this corporate sun ruling. And so we see 12 as a number that often comes up. Then Jesus speaks again in Revelation 3 verse 21. And he says, to the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So, where did Jesus overcome? He overcame in his temporal life, in his time on earth. That was when he was perfected in obedience through the things he suffered, but he overcame. He overcame to be able to be declared by God, this is my beloved son. This is my fully matured son in whom I'm well pleased. And so Jesus says, we will sit with him on that throne as we overcome. What are we to overcome? We to overcome Everything that the enemy throws at us in this temporal life to distract you from what God's purpose is. He will cause you to want to be concerned, stressed and worried. He'll cause you to want to give up. He'll cause you to want to pursue things in your own strength. He'll cause you even to be greatly successful if that's what's going to destroy you. Um, if that's what's going to keep you from seeing things in the eternal realm. He doesn't mind causing you great success uh, in the temporal realm, in what man regards as success. So, he doesn't want Christ to be revealed in us. He doesn't want us to come to maturity as son, so Christ is revealed. So, the overcoming is overcoming everything that the enemy will put in the way as a stumbling block, as a source of distraction, to cause you not to mature as a son of God so that Christ is revealed. Let's go through the book of Revelation, just some passages, just to see the big picture. I know I'm reading a lot of scripture today. You'll have to follow with me. In scripture, we're not putting it up on the screen or else you won't see me on the video at all because uh, much of this is scripture. Revelations 5 verse 9 and 10. And they sang a new song and the song was this. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and by your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. 
and they will reign upon the earth. So there's a people that God has purchased. This people is not like any people that exist on the earth in their own tribes and tongues and language, distinction and identity. This people had their identity in Christ. It is the one holy nation. And this nation that God makes to be a kingdom and priests, a kingdom and priests, and we can go into great detail, just a teaching on that, but both, a kingdom and priests to serve our God, that will reign on the earth. So this is not now only in the temporal realm. This nation of God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation is the people of God that he establishes that will reign on the earth forever. Well, let's just look at Revelations 20. I'm going to read quite a large portion of this so that you can see the context. Go and study Revelation 20. Go and look at the teachings. Sam goes in depth under um, the current affairs section on the Sam Solon app. Go and look at these and listen to these. And he speaks in great detail. But I want you just to see the, the big picture. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key to the abyss holding in his hand a great chain. Now, there's a lot that happens before this. The enemy is eventually bound, and he is then bound up and put in the abyss. So he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent. We see the connotation with the serpent that tempted Adam and Eve so that they would not enter in to being accurate representations as sons of God in the earth. That same one, the dragon, the serpent, who is the devil and Satan. So now we know who the serpent is. And bound him for a thousand years. So we see this angel binding Satan and binding him, throwing him in the abyss for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss, shut it, and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were complete. So now there's a time, we can go into great depth of this, but there's been many teachings. I want to give you the overarch of what I'm saying that God is preparing us for this. But we understand that um, there's a lot going to happen bringing about this thousand year period. After that there will be a short time that the enemy Satan will be released and he will try and deceive as many as he can. It says after that he must be released for a brief period of time. Then I saw the thrones and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. See here we are. We're in the thousand years. Before the thousand years, those who have returned with Christ, they receive their glorified bodies. We don't precede them. Those who are alive and remain in the earth don't precede them. First, those that return with Christ receive their glorified bodies. And then those who are alive and remain in an instant will receive our glorified bodies. So now we're living with glorified bodies in a period called the millennium, the thousand years in which the enemy is bound and we now who? This is what we've been trained for. I want you to see this. This is what God is training you for, to be able to rule. And this is part of the eternal because 
you'll see there's a thousand years and then there's forever. Let's look at it, what scripture says. And I saw the thrones and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So yeah, we see again the reigning with him, seated with him on his throne. Placed on, in another reference, 12 thrones, which is a picture of divine governance. Now, it goes on and it says, Let's just touch this part where it says uh, those who had not received the mark of the beast on their forehead and their hands. Later on we will see, as we close off this passage, we will see those who had not received the mark on their foreheads or hands are the same ones who have received the mark of God on their foreheads. So this is obviously not some type of barcode or some type of chip or some type of physical thing. This speaks of a mindset. This speaks of that which you, your thoughts and your, your mindset and that which you do in, in, with your hands and your actions and your activities are not controlled by the thinking of this world and of the, of the beast and of the systems of this world. These ones who reign... They have the mark of, of God. They have the mindset of the thoughts of God. They have the mind of Christ in their dealings. It goes on and says, The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were complete. And this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. The second death is the death of those who are not sons of God, who are not entered into eternal life, but are then subject to death. They, death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is what God is preparing us for in this temporal life. Everything we're going through is but a training for this reigning for a thousand years. Let's go on to chapter 22 of Revelations. Verse 4 and 5 says, They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. So this is now in comparison to those that had the, the mark of the beast, the thinking of the systems of this world. These ones that see his face and rule and reign with him, his name is on their foreheads. His thoughts are their thoughts. And speaking of the city of God, this new Jerusalem, this the city of where it says there will be no more night in the city and they will have no need for the light of a lamp or of the sun for the Lord will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. So we see this picture of reigning. It's the thousand years that we are reigning and then it speaks of this. This is Revelation 22. It speaks of the city of God, this new Jerusalem, and it says we will reign forever and ever. And this is what God is preparing us for. We, we might want God to bless our efforts and endeavors in the temple realm. Very often, People think God is God wants to bless me means that He wants uh, every endeavor I do to go well. 
He wants me to get ahead in life. He wants me to be able to secure for myself the things I want to secure. He wants me to accomplish the things I've set goals to accomplish because I find significance in them or I find a people's praises from that or whatever the motivation is for wanting to accomplish those things. It's great to have goals in life and it's great to have a good work ethic and, and go for it. But people find their identity in that. And they get stressed out of that as if that's the goal. And then they think that God just wants to bless them means God has to bless what they're doing. Their activities, their vision, their mission, their endeavors, their business and their things that they are so concerned about. When in fact that's not what God is busy with. God is busy preparing us for what is His goal. His goal has got nothing to do with the things you want to accomplish to find significance or to find applause from people, get people's praise and admiration and adoration. God's not interested in any of that. For you to accomplish it so that you can feel good about yourself or look good or make money or be regarded as successful. Everything God is doing is in fact preparing us for His goal. His goal is that we be mature sons who can rule and reign with Him. And that is eternity. That's eternal thing that doesn't take place in this temporal life. The life that we are so obsessed about and so concerned about that most of our prayers to God to help us and bless us are about those things. Let me tell you what the blessing of God is. The blessing of God is not Him giving you stuff. The blessing of God is when Christ is formed in you. That's blessing. The blessing is Christ is being formed in you. Sometimes it doesn't look like the charismatics would say it is. The stuff you have and the stuff you get. Very often that is the opposite of a blessing. It's a distraction from Christ being formed in you. Get so consumed with yourself and your own abilities and your own pursuits. Life is temporal but it is just for training. What it's training us for is the eternal weight of glory, ruling and reigning for a thousand years, ruling with Him and reigning with Him forever and ever. Those who in this life, while you have all these distractions and stresses and things that the enemy is throwing at you, the systems of this world are shouting and proclaiming lies and distractions. While all of that's going on, those who are obedient to God, in faith, you come to God in obedience. There is a grace now to support you and and sustain you amidst all those challenges because you've set your heart on obedience. And for those, there's given a crown. You will rule. Him who has been faithful in the little will be given much to rule over. Those who are disobedient, and disobedience doesn't mean you didn't say the sinner's prayer, doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Let's call it a a child of God. Some people have asked Jesus to be their Savior. They say Savior and Lord, but they actually just mean Savior. Um, If Lordship was in play, they would have come to maturity. They would have followed his instructions. But it's not about Lordship for many. It's about having your, your ticket to heaven, being saved. So you don't go to hell, you go to heaven. 
those who are just saved but never learned obedience and just carried on with their own life, their own endeavors, their own pursuits, never paying attention to the instruction of the Lord and bringing their souls to obedience of the leading of the Spirit, they will be in the millennium saved in glorified bodies, but they will be ruled over. They will not be ruling. They will be ruled over with a rod of iron. It is not going to be now by faith. It is now only by strict obedience that they will be able to come in and be matured. As God now uses the millennium to bring them to a maturity. And so everything we see in this life is temporal and we can see it just with temporal eyes or we can enter into that which God is doing now where he's giving us spiritual eyes to see, to see things from an eternal perspective so that we can make every use and of the opportunity we have to mature and grow in this life, learning obedience, learning to see things from eternal perspective. So that what we go through now is just the learning school, it's just the preparation for the real purpose of the body of Christ, the mature corporate son, ruling and reigning. Those who don't choose to obey now will be ruled over. But those who learn obedience, there will be a reward. They will rule over much because they were faithful in the little. And so when we see this reality of what is true and what God is doing, you realize it's silly to get all worked up and stressed about that which is going on in your temporal life. Don't sweat the little stuff. And it's all little stuff. Everything in this temporal life is little stuff. It has no value except for the schooling that it offers you to be trained in obedience. Make use of those opportunities. See every trial, see every situation as an opportunity to say, Lord, what are you forming in me? What are you doing in me? How are you maturing me in this how are you training me to be one who can rule? And that's what we do. We keep our eye on the prize. We don't look at these crazy temporal things around us. In a world that is going to be destroyed, nothing's going to remain. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And only that which is born of the eternal things. Only that which is of the kingdom of God will remain. Keep your eye on the prize. The prize is the inheritance we have in Christ to rule and reign with Him. The prize is not to go to heaven. It's being included in the Elohim in whom God saw us from the beginning. When he said, let us make, we were included in that us. We were included in the picture of the Elohim. We've done these teachings on the magistrates of God. Where Jesus himself refers to, to this when they wanted to stone him. And he refers to Psalm 2 where it speaks of, God calling us gods. And it's not because we are gods in ourselves. It's because we are included in Christ. And when we are included in Christ, when we are seated with Him in heavenly places, that's our view and our mindset and our perspective, eternal perspective, but also on His throne, ruling with Him on His throne, 
we are included in that Elohim, the magistrates of God, that are effectively ruling and reigning. Once you see this, you won't let the things in this world get you down, stress you out. You will actually see it in what it's producing. And that little song that we used to sing even as children, turn your eyes upon Jesus, but it says, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. What He's producing in us, even through, through these temporal things, is a far exceedingly greatly above and beyond anything we can imagine. That glory is what He's working in us. And then we won't get distracted, get burdened, become depressed or lose hope because of the things happening in this life. The worst that can happen to you, if you think about it, is you could die. And if you die, you continue in eternity. So even if they kill you, that's not a big deal. And even if we die, we will return with Christ and receive glorified bodies and we will rule and reign with Him. So nothing on this earth has any hold on you, has any ability to cause you to fear, to cause you to be anxious. Press in to the goal that God is perfecting us and training us for reigning. We'll speak more. God bless you.